Hello everyone, my name is Zach and welcome to my channel. Amongst other things, I'm a reenactor and a jouster. And today I want to give you a book recommendation. Now I've just finished reading this awesome book, Armour of the English Knight, 1450 to 1500 by Tobias Capwell. And many of you will already be aware of Toby. He um, is a doctor he's a curator at the Wallace collection in London and he is also a jouster and um, he's been very involved in the modern jousting scene um, he has multiple awesome lectures that you can see online uh, but he's also written this book he's written lots of books but he's written this one which is part two of a three-part series um, which is kind of based on his uh, PhD um, work but it's also it's expanded from that because his PhD work was um, focusing mainly on effigies in England um, and these books actually go further than that and they uh, they cover a wider um, array of art to do with uh, English armour and armour in the 15th century. One of the really awesome things about these books is that they make widely available the um, information about English armour, which up until now has really not been available on this scale. Um, obviously, those of us that live in England have access to the original effigies, um, but we have very little surviving English armour, no surviving full... Um, full harnesses so there's really um there's there's not been a huge amount of information widely available for a very long time and uh, um and these books do a great job of not only sharing that information but making it um accessible toby's writing is very clear um and there's some uh some key points that i'd like to kind of share with you from this book really what i really want you to do is go out and buy it because the more of these books that sell the more um the more ability there is for uh people like toby to write new books on this kind of subject you know if he can prove that there is a market for it then uh, um then he and others like him will be able to write more books on this topic and get more of this information out to a wider audience. So a few things that I, uh, I would like us, uh, I'd like to share with you from this book. OK, so one of them, whenever Toby says that he doesn't know something or he doesn't think something exists, he says to the best of the author's knowledge or to the author's knowledge. And I, that just struck me. That is so different to how so many of us speak. It's so different to how many of us YouTubers speak. It's so different to how many reenactors speak. But it is so, um, it's so useful, and it's such a good thing to say. I think because it it recognizes that none of our information is complete. It allows us to change our position when new information comes to light. You know, how many Internet um, arguments have been caused by people who have backed themselves into a corner and then they're unable to um, to step away from, you know, the hill that they've decided that they, they're going to die on. Whereas if you say, to the best of my knowledge, that didn't happen or to the best, I've never seen information about I've never seen any evidence of that. It's possible they did it, but I've not seen evidence of it. That is such a good way of sharing what you know, but it leaves yourself um, so much room to then adjust your uh, adjust your perspective when new information comes to light, which is so important in this field, um, especially in fields such as English armour, where so little research has been done. You know, Toby, um, he started this in-depth study. He's kind of the first person to do this. I'm sure there'll be loads more coming 
I'm sure there'll be some information coming from uh, private collections and we'll find out more and more as more information comes to light. Um, so that's something that I think we should all do. I think especially on uh, internet discussion and I think especially when presenting to the public as reenactors or educators. Set using that phrase or something like it, to the best of my knowledge, um, I think that's that's a really uh, good thing to be doing. Okay, secondly, it's um, when he's looking at these uh, um, these armors, he says that the uh, all of the aspects of English armor are typically English and in the uh, um, in the period in the medieval period in the 15th century um, on the continent they do, do describe things as oh this uh, creases in the English style and so on but none of the um, none of the things like closed creases or um, symmetrical pauldrons or anything like that are a hundred percent specifically English. You do see them on the continent as well. Okay, the um, the wings on the inside of the knee, uh, Pauline. All of these things are seen in situations on the continent, but it's the collection of them all together that make them English. I think we can very quickly um, try and uh, put things into uh, into brackets, and we can say right. Uh, if it's got closed creases, it must be English. And all English armors had closed creases, okay? That is really not what the evidence suggests. Um, there are very strong themes to armor from different places. There are definitely styles and there are fashions that go on. But no one thing can mark out an armor as from a particular place. You need to look at the armor as a whole, and um, and because these armors were made for individuals um, who um, who are making a statement when they have the armor commissioned, we very often find that there are some things that will surprise us. We shouldn't be surprised when we're surprised. That's kind of a, a strange thing to say, but I think there's definitely truth in it. We shouldn't be surprised when we find something that doesn't match our strict guidelines. Because when they had these armors made, they were pushing the envelope. They were really, um, they were trying new things. They were going, oh, look at this. I wonder if this works. Or, oh, I really like that. My, um, you know, yeah, maybe an Italian knight saw some English armor when he was off, um, off visiting a tournament he was like wow I really like that aspect so he gets his armourers to do something the armours as well the if you have an individual armour if your armour looks individual then that is a sign of wealth mass produced armours are available in the 15th century but it is the armours that look individual that have kind of slightly uh odd things about them that are a sign of wealth and that is partially what an armor is for it is to show that you are above other people it is to al align you in the class of a knight and so um having something a little bit strange a little bit out of the norm that doesn't fit into our neat little boxes that we've written in the uh, in the 21st century is actually a good thing um for uh for knights and for for the nobility okay the third thing that i'd like to share here is um is something that is obviously very close to my heart if you're if you've been on this channel for a while you know that i talk a lot about cavalry in the 15th century and particularly in an english context um and so you're probably getting a bit fed off of it if this is the first video that you've seen, then hit like and subscribe and all of those things. I'm apparently supposed to say that before the end. But I am constantly hearing reenactors and um, and historians talk about the English way of fighting 
and how English people or English knights, English men at arms always fought on foot and how uh, I've even heard English armour. It's impossible to ride a horse in English armour, which is completely incorrect. <laughs> um, we've known that ever since the first, you know, the first uh, um, reproduction English armors have been made. Um, obviously, like I said, we don't have any examples of full harnesses. We've had some amazing reproduction armors of both early and late English armor being made, and they have been used by um, modern reenactors, modern jousters, and they work really, really well. English armor. Um, throughout the century is trying to do this really really difficult thing the English knight appears to want their cake and they want to eat it as well they want to be able to be as um, as protected as they possibly can while also being um, as mobile as they possibly can as well it's such a difficult thing and um, and you see things coming in and out of fashion. And what I really like about the way that Toby has written this book is that he goes through it in period and he talks about not only the benefits, but the drawbacks. And you start seeing things going on. Well, you know, something happened in history. Someone took a wound in a particular place in the thigh. And then you start seeing longer folds developing and um, more people having um, fully enclosed creases. But all of these things are still all uh, all being used to fight on horseback as well. The aim is always to be able to ride to and from battle and to fight from horseback if you still can. Now, you might come back at me and you might say, Zach, of course you're going to say that because you like to ride, you are a jouster, so uh, so you're going to take that side. Well, I would point you, if you're one of those people who think that it, 15th century English armour stops you from riding, I would point you to the 16th century foot tournament tonlet armours and see what they look like. Because they are completely different to well, not completely different, they share some similarities with 15th century English knights and men-at-arms armour, but there is a very clear emphasis to just fighting on foot. The extremely wide fold and long fold that prevents you from riding a horse. And some of these 16th century armours have these tonlet skirts removable so that then um, you could ride to a tournament and then hop down and have the tonlet attached. This is not the same as the quite long fold that we see in the 15th century with tassets attached. In fact, the foot combat tournament armors, the tonlet armors, uh, very often do not have tassets at all. So we can say that tassets uh, appear to be... Um, they're, they're a a nod to the fact that the English man at arms is attempting to have the best of both worlds. He's got the long tonlet, which is useful, uh, the long fold, which is useful for fighting on foot. And then he's also got the, um, the tassets, which are useful for fighting on, uh, on horse and, uh, um, and also for providing reinforcements to his, um, to his, fold when he's fighting on foot so i'd really ask please reenactors stop saying that english armor is just for fighting on foot it is an amazing creation yes it is optimized for fighting on foot that is what for most of the 15th century most english men at arms were trying to do please don't mishear me but it is one of those um one of those things where they're trying to have their cake and eat it too. They're trying to get the best of both worlds. And um, please do uh, get yourself a copy of this book and the first one if you can find it, uh, because it goes into huge amounts of detail about that. 
also toby is currently um finishing off the third book we really really want to um to see that so the more sales that i'm, I'm not being told to i'm not getting anything from this this is, i bought this book myself it's not sponsored or anything but i want that third book and if toby makes all the money from selling this second book then uh then maybe that will inspire him to uh to get that third book ready thank you guys please do like share and subscribe i hope you enjoyed this video and hopefully i will see you in my next one bye bye